bit of new content before we start reviewing. So let's go ahead and hit record and let's begin. These are gonna be kind of brief. Um, we're gonna talk about it a little bit and then we're gonna move forward. This is all stuff that, you know, we don't need to spend too much time on. So we're gonna talk about the causes and effects of domestic and internal migration over time. Uh, Sunbelt, Central Air, Immigration Nationality Act. I think the only one on here that isn't a repeat is Central Air and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward. Um, first key point. After 1990, the political, economic, and cultural influence of the American Southwest can, and West, I should say, continued to increase as populations shifted to those areas. So basically, what that means is, what you're getting is, post-World War II, a bunch of people moved to the South and the West, right? Those are the Sunbelt states. After 1990, even more people are moving to the Sunbelt states. And it's becoming a more and more popular place to live. And we will talk about why in about a minute. About 30 seconds. All right, let's go to move forward. Let's talk about migration. So um, in the chat, somebody tell me again, what's the difference between migration and immigration? Somebody tell me, give me, give me a few seconds. Migration, immigration, what's the difference? What is the difference between migration and immigration? What do we got guys? Migration is within the same country. That is correct. And an immigrant is from where? And an immigrant is from where? Foreign. Yes, a foreign country. Exactly. Nailed it. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about what happened in migration. It's outside of a country. Yes, nailed it. Okay. Again, a significant number of people are migrating to the Sun Belt states. This is in part because people are sick of the winter. We talked about this earlier, as well as people moving there for jobs in the defense industry. This is the Sun Belt right here. These are Sun Belt states. Another major reason people move to the Sun Belt states is the advent of cheap and available air conditioning, central air conditioning. Um, homes in the Sun Belt were even more attractive because now you could actually sit in there and it wasn't 105 degrees in your house. Um, if anybody's been in a home without AC, like my grandparents' house when I was growing up used to not have AC, and it was rough in the summer in Texas in those houses. You guys may or may not know what I'm talking about. I know nowadays most people have AC, but it was a thing, and it is not comfortable. But once AC becomes cheap and easy and everybody can get it, it's more easy to live there. Uh, general populations in the South and Southwest tended to lean more conservative because of people moving there and the type of people moving there. But that means that more conservative leaning seats are added to the House, whereas the North loses some of their seats in Congress. It's just something to keep in mind as the place kind of shifts. There's a lot of major population centers in the Sun Belt where there wasn't before. So I'll give you about a minute on here, and then we will move forward. About 20 seconds.
All right, let's move forward. Let's talk about international immigration. Um, international immigrants migrated to Sunbelt states as well. Many came from Latin America and Mex from Latin American countries as well as Mexico. I don't know why I stumbled over that. And they were looking for agricultural work and another group came from the Middle East and Asia due to economic impact with all these immigrants coming in. Ecologists started to, economists started to argue that the immigrants coming in were greatly impacting the economy in a good positive way, often working in jobs that no Americans are willing to do. Um, so what people start to realize while this was going on, I spaced these out weird, I apologize for that. Um, these waves of immigrants are actually helping the American economy. They're helping stimulate it in part because they do jobs that nobody wants to do, but in part because their very presence stimulates, you know, a working class that wasn't there before. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but the, again, the biggest thing is people find they do studies and it's something like they do jobs that like i think it's something to, like a ridiculous number of like 90 some percent of my immigrants coming into the united states do a job that no one that america like is one percent of americans would want or something like that it's like some crazy number i don't think it's quite a statistical zero but it's really close in the sense that they do jobs people don't want and they help stimulate the economy that's what people have found lately anyways um immigration stimulates the economy makes it a little better Let's go on to the second key point. International migration from Latin America and Asia increased dramatically, as well as new immigrants affected US culture in many ways and supplied the economy with an important labor force. It's basically what we said at the top, right? But keep it in mind. Give you about a minute or so. We don't need too much time here. And again, if you need more time or you need me to back up and go through something, let me know because I'm going to go through these quick because, like I said, uh, we're covering two topics today. Why people? Um, so there's a few reasons for that, right? Why people from California are moving to Texas? That's actually a really good question. Um, this is another migration that we're actually seeing, right? It's something you're seeing live. It's actually really cool to look at. Um, when you drive around Texas, the number of plates that are from California or other places, right, are, are, are staggering. Um, there's a few reasons. One of them, from what I can tell, is that California has very strict and very large amounts of taxes people pay. And some people just try to get away from that. There's some people that just don't want to pay their fair share. There's other people who say, well, look at all these taxes I pay and then look at the state of some of the cities, right? Cities like Los Angeles and places like that, they have homeless epidemics. There's a lot of tents and tent cities within those cities like slums. And the police are not able, like the reason you don't see a lot of that in certain parts of Texas is because there's laws against it, right? Like the reason all of those, like there's no slums in Houston, for example, I'll use Houston as an example, is because in Houston, the police can get those people and send them and not arrest them, but like make them leave, right? Like, hey, you're trespassing, leave. Um, in California, that's not the case. Um, I'm not here to talk about whether or not the laws are good or bad. I'm just saying that's what the case. Um, so people see the city they're in, they see the taxes they're paying, they don't like it, they wanna leave, right? Some people just do are doing it because it's popular, right? Famous comedians like Joe Rogan did it and a bunch of other comedians did it and a bunch of other people will do it because of it. And also it's because of COVID. Um, because in COVID in California, right? Like California is still all locked down. You still can't go to places, right? You still can only go to the grocery store and then go back home. And some people are sick of that. Some people either don't take COVID seriously or they're like, hey, I understand I'm vaccinated. I'm wearing my mask. I should be able to go places, right? And Texas and other states, Texas isn't the only one, but they do that. They're going to make Texas lame look at Austin. Um, I don't mind Austin. I mean, here's the thing. I could never live in Austin, but Austin's cool for a visit. Um, they may or may not make Texas lame. Um, you never know. Part of why, maybe they're all moving here and they're going to remember why they moved and they're going to, you know, you know, it's hard to say. But that's, those are mainly the reasons why there's a big migration happening right now from California and places like California to Texas. They're moving other places too. Some people are moving to like Tennessee. Some people are moving to like Montana. I've heard of people moving to Montana from California. Um, but that's that's possible. That's possible. It's possible that all the Californians could move to Texas and ruin it. Um, my next state is Wyoming. Don't tell anybody, guys. Y'all know, all right? If the Californians ruin Texas, Galassos is going to Wyoming. So just keep it on the down low before they ruin Wyoming next. Um, so I might die in the snow, but you know, so 
you got to roll the dice with these things. <laughs> um, immigration, this is going to be really brief. Um, the reason more immigrants are coming in is because the Immigration and Nationality Act, which we already talked about when we talked about Lyndon Johnson. This allowed immigrants to come into America in larger numbers. Combined with reforms and the Immigration Reform and Control Act, I'm sorry, and the rise of illegal immigrants, major uh, US demographics have changed. So basically, you get this, uh, this law that allows more immigrants to come in. Then you get another law that allows more immigrants to come in. And then on top of that, illegal immigrants are coming into the United States. And that is making the demographics shift. And there's more and more immigrants every day, and it's harder and harder to deal with. You see it right now on the borders, right? there's issues coming up. Um, again, we're not here to speak on specific ones, but just something to keep in mind. People want to be here. America is the place to be. I'll give you about 30 seconds and then we'll move on. And I know if you're looking for the slides, they are not up yet. I will post them when we are done. Again, I apologize for that. I was in a parent meeting right up until eight o'clock. All right, let's move forward. So minorities, question mark. <laughs> um, here are just some numbers for you. Prior to 1965, internal immigration contributed to about 10% of the American population. Since then, nowadays, they make up over one third. Over 9 million immigrants entered the United States in the 1990s, while the white population has steadily declined. Um, in the 1990s, whites made up over 75% of the population. Now in the 2000s, if the trends continue, um, you will see, I'm sorry, now in the 2000s, they make up something like 60%, um, something like that. So like 65%. I can't believe I didn't put the number in there. I'll double check and put the number in before I post this. Um, if these trends continue soon, white Americans will no longer be the majority. They will be a minority race. It will be mixed with all sorts of different immigrants and no one will have an even majority. Minority, is it a thing, right? So. I'll leave this up for a little bit. Again, just some numbers for you. Um, guys, really quick, remind me yes or no. Did I tell you guys how the exam virtual and the AP exam in person and paper are different? While we're doing this, because if not, I'll do that in the interim. Because I don't remember anymore. Did I? I don't think I did. Let me know if I did. This virtual choice that I want to look at. Yes. So basically, you guys that did the virtual, right? You had to answer all five SAQs, right? Or six SAQs or something like that. They gave you two sets of SAQs, right? You had to answer them all. It was like a set of three and a set of three, right? You didn't get to choose. Um, so basically, the difference is on the paper test, it's the same test. It's a test that it's always been. It's a test I told you about the beginning of the year, right? Multiple choice section. They give you four SAQs. You pick three to answer. Well, you, you answer two and then you pick one, right? Then they give you a DBQ that you have to answer. And then they give you an LEQ. They give you three prompts and you pick one. That's the paper test. On the paper test in multiple choice, you can go back and forth. You can look around. You can do all that stuff. In the virtual test on the multiple choice, you cannot go back and forth. If you, when you're at number one, you got to answer number one, then you got to move to number two, you cannot go back to number one. And they also give you, instead of an LEQ, they give you two sets of SAQs, but you have to answer every single one of them. So they'll give you, I think five total or six total, and you have to answer all of them. You cannot pick, you cannot decide which ones you want to answer. You got to answer them all. You get stuck with what they give you. Um, so it's for those two reasons mainly that I really, really recommend try the paper test. I know you could, if you couldn't come in for the virtual, try to come in for the paper. Um, for the, I'm sorry, that you can come in for the mock, try to come in for the real one. And if you cannot come in for the real one, as we get closer to review, I need you to let me know. Um, so that way we can kind of 
the real ones on May 6th. Um, I would like to get, honestly, I'd want all, I want everybody here, but if you really, really like, if your parents are like, no, you cannot go, I understand, but like, you know, trust me, it'd be, I think it's, yes, it's a marathon. Yes. It's hard writing on paper again. It's been so long, but trust me, it's easier. In fact, I'm even thinking about letting you guys write if you want to for exit tickets moving forward and just posting pictures if you want to practice writing, because I know it's a lot of writing that you're going to have to do. And I know your hands have probably all atrophied and lost the writing practice skills. But again, again, I cannot stress enough that paper test is where it's at, in my opinion, because you get to pick some of the questions that you answer. And typically, we do better when we get to pick what we answer for the most part. And, and again, I just don't trust not going back and forth in multiple choice. That doesn't make sense to me as a person. Okay, so there is not an exit ticket yet. Instead, we're going to go into the next topic. We got two topics to cover. And this one is the big one. This one has a lot of terms, all new terms. And this one's got a fairly decent amount of slides and topics to cover. So if you have more AP questions, I will answer them at the end. For now, let's get into our topic, shall we? So um, challenges of the 21st century is the name. This is the last bit of new material for a push. Um, we're going to talk about 9-11, we're going to talk about the election of 2000, we're going to talk about the war on terror, Operation Iraqi Freedom, a little bit of Desert Storm, and then we're going to get into some of the domestic issues and changes that occurred, as well as climate change again, because why not? And again, our objective, right, we're going to talk about causes and effects of domestic and internal challenges the United States has faced in the 21st century. All right, let's go ahead and move on. <clears throat> Key point number one. In the wake of the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in 2001, the United States launched military efforts against terrorism and the length controversial, conf lengthy, that should say lengthy controversial conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. In Iraq. Um, that should say lengthy, not length. Um, I'll give you about a minute and a half, and then we will move forward. Before we get into 9-11, though, we will talk about the election of 2000. About a few more seconds. All right. So the election of 2000 between George W. Bush, baby Bush, and Al Gore. This election was disputed because of how close the election went. It literally came down to very, 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 very smooth, small numbers. Uh, they gave it to Bush over four electoral votes, I believe, or five, was that five? Um, the Supreme Court had to settle this. The Supreme Court had to go in and like count the ballots and award the victor. And they gave it to George W. Bush over Al Gore. So that's the election of 2000. If you ever hear it referenced like on the news or on the internet when you're talking about elections, It'll almost always get referenced now because of how close this was and how controversial it was. All 
All right. Let's move forward though and let's talk about 9-11. September 11, 2001, Al-Qaeda was the name of the group that used partially internet and cell phone technology in a way that hadn't been used before to coordinate an attack on the United States of America. They hijacked four commercial airplanes and crashed two of them into the World Trade Center in New York and another one into the Pentagon. A fourth plane crashed in the countryside because the, pencil, the passengers rose up and fought them off the plane and essentially crashed it, um, thwarting the plan that the terrorists had. They uh, believe it was going to the Pentagon as well. Um, yeah, this is a interesting time period to say the least. Um, I will say that probably not, well, no, not probably, not since Pearl Harbor had the United States ever been deliberately attacked like this. And not since Pearl Harbor had the United has the United States been as united during this time period, right? Everybody wanted they wanted to justice for what happened. Um, a lot of innocent people died here. Um, I was in school. I was younger than you guys. I was in elementary school. I was in like fourth grade when this happened, and it was uh, it was shocking. Honestly, um, we had no idea what was going on, right? Like, I remember the teacher was like in the middle of mid sentence just kind of stopped trailed off um and then went went to the door and then they were speaking for a little while then they came back in and we're like oh you know stuff and then they went out again and they came in and they wheeled the tv and the tv card this is back in the day when there was tv cards not projectors and they just put the news on and it was scary you know shocking um devastating stuff devastating um and I'll show you some images from it in a second to show you how, how bad it got. But um, yeah, just uh, this is a big deal. This is going to make a lot of this is going to change everything. Like the, America was going a certain path and it's going to it'll never be the same after this, essentially. For reasons that we can get into later. Here's some images and I'll go back right now. This is the fourth plane. This is what's left of it um, after the crash. Some firefighters in the buildings. Um, yes, it was in the morning. It was like, I think it was 8.30 or 9 a.m. New York time. Um, people were still getting to work. People were at work. Um, the thing that you remember um, most about it is that at first that you thought it was an accident. Like it didn't seem real, right? Like, oh my God, a plane crashed into the building. That's, that's terrifying. And then um, I know from what I, what you've read and what you can see, like you can look this stuff up. Um, there's firefighters in the building, right? It's like, let's get to work, let's do this. And they're, they're working in there. And then a second plane hits the other tower, right? The South Tower and the North Tower. And, you know, eventually the buildings collapsed and people inside died. It did not go well. I know that for firefighters that were at 9-11, there's... Um, that's that I didn't had not heard that story. Um, that's oh man, that's uh, yeah, that's tragic on a whole other level. Um, there's all sorts of stories like that though um, about yeah the the dogs. That's intense. So basically, the the story is guys that no that um, the dogs for the first responders were were getting like discouraged and sad because they they could smell and they knew people were alive underneath the rubble but the the rescuers couldn't get them out and so that some of the first responders were like burying themselves in the rubble so the dogs could be like look i found the person and kind of like you know not be in a slum because dogs obviously don't understand like i can't move this rubble right dogs are trained to find the people under the rubble um i know for a fact that a lot of the first responders that were there there are very few of them left. A lot of them got very sick because they're breathing in fumes and jet fuel and building dust all day and night. And um, a lot of them got sick and, and passed since then. I don't think there's that many left around. We can, there's foundations for it and stuff. It's been a few, it's been 20 years though. It's been a while. Um, but there's all sorts of crazy, crazy heroic stories. We don't have the time to really get into them. And, you know, unfortunately it's not necessarily something you need to know, but I encourage you to look them up. Stuff like that is really fascinating to see. It's a really, uh, I don't say proud because proud doesn't quite make sense, but it's a very uh, revealing time, I think, for, for first responders in the United States during this time period. 
Um, again, some images. This is the Pentagon from up high. Pentagon, by the way, is a big like military building. Just some of the things. This is a very famous picture. You guys have seen this picture. I think we even hit this picture at the beginning of the year. Um, and then this is the plane that crashed in the field. Um, but there was a response, right? So this is George Bush at nine um, at the towers. Not since Pearl Harbor had Americans been so united and Bush will lead the US into a war on terror, right? Bush will demand that the Afghanistan government run by the Taliban will hand over Osama bin Laden, who was the person who create, who you know did the attack, but the Taliban government will refuse and Bush will send troops to Afghanistan and quickly overthrow the Taliban government. However, they struggle to, they don't find bin Laden. Bin Laden has been into, goes into hiding essentially. Um, you guys probably know the story of how bin Laden was killed because it was during Obama's presidency. Obama is the president that finally takes out bin Laden and you know avenges the person who thought up the 9-11 attack. Um, but yes, so if initially that's what we do. We invade Afghanistan to topple the Taliban government because the Taliban were supporting Al Qaeda and to find bin Laden, which they do not manage to find bin Laden. That is not the only conflict though that we are in. And we'll get into that other conflict in a few seconds. I wanna make sure we have some time. All right, let's go to move forward. So again, that's bin Laden. If you didn't know what he looked like, some more images of soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think that's Afghanistan. Oh, this one might be Iraq. But um, yeah, let's talk about Operation Iraqi Freedom. So Bush also opened up a war in Iraq um, because according to the administration, there was evidence that Saddam Hussein, who was a dictator in Iraq, had helped with the 9-11 attack. This evidence was later disproven, found to be not true. There was also evidence that Saddam Hussein was developing and holding weapons of mass destruction, nukes, right? And nukes can blow the world up. We don't want nukes lying around. This evidence, though, was also later disproven. So the reasons we went to war with Iraq are found to be disproved here. Operation Iraqi Freedom was um, there to get rid of Hussein and put in a U.S. friendly government, but the region is a very unstable one, and it turns out that it's not that easy to set up a government in there. Um, and we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan ever since. Fighting has escalated and decreased as time went on, but there has been fighting throughout. All right, so I'll leave you about a minute on here, then we'll move forward. About 30 seconds. If you're talking about Saddam Hussein, um, yes, but not like the U.S. The um, he was uh, found guilty of war crimes and stuff because he was a really cruel and like messed up dictator. Like he, Saddam Hussein wasn't like he was innocent in the sense that he didn't help with 9/11 and he didn't have nukes. But he's not a good guy, right? He's not like the guys in the 50s that America was like buy a dictator and replace somebody else. 
he was a cruel dictator. He had a very bad reputation. He tried to invade Kuwait in the 90s, and we'll talk about that in a second, and the U.S. had to stop him then, too. Um, and so, yeah, he was hung for war crimes. Um, I forget where, but it wasn't like America that did it. It was the, the, not the UN either, but like the world. It was like somewhere in the Middle East. But yeah, they hung him for war crimes. And they found him in like a little hole and he had the beard and stuff. Like, maybe you guys, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I remember when it was a big deal. Let me see if I can find it for you. Do I, maybe I have it in here. I don't. Okay. I can't believe I didn't put pictures of Saddam Hussein up here. So this is Saddam Hussein, a dictator. Uh, where's the one where he was captured? Is this it? Yeah, this is him when he was captured. This is what he looks like after. Here's another Saddam Hussein. Um, this is him when they found him, the Americans found him. This, again, this uh, toppling Saddam's government for the United States did not take long. It was, it was a fairly easy thing what was harder and what took longer is the counterinsurgency and putting up the uh, the government after him um okay so key point two war on terrorism sought to improve security within the united states but also raised questions about the protection of civil liberties and human rights so to pick a soldier oh yeah that's a so like let me if i put in like saddam hussein captured i'll probably find some good stuff um, I had an uncle that was in Iraqi freedom and talks about like all the crazy palaces they would go to like the soldiers and like it was intense. Yeah, there's pictures of a soldier. Eh, this is not that appropriate. Maybe we shouldn't <laughs> show these. But yeah, you can find pictures of the soldiers posing with him and stuff. Um, I think there's one of the group posing with like the toilet that he was using because he was using like some old person toilet to, you know, poop in a hole in a cave. Um, but yeah, there's... Um, Oh, where's the we got him? I got to find the we got him newspaper. Hold on, I got to show you this. There it is. This is a very, very famous um, front line, right? Dayton Daily News. We got him. Got him. Saddam Hussein captured. Like that's, there was stuff like that everywhere. Alabadi took him out. Alabadi took him out. Um, but again, so this war on terror thing brings up issues with human rights. We got him. Yeah, there's another one in here that's and like, you know what him. that caused, guys? A power vacuum because once you kill the dictator in a really multi ethnic country, then you're going to have an insurgency between the loyalists and then in, uh, the ones that are going to be working with the Americans. And that's why uh, Iraq became what we call a quagmire or a cluster fun word. <laughs> yeah, Iraq did not go well. That's why we're still like in Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff, right? Because now, yeah, well now we're gonna get out, but we were there for 10-ish more years because we just couldn't set the government up. It didn't work power back. And remember guys, it's pronounced Iraq, Iraq, and it's pronounced Afghanistan. Not Afghanistan, Iraq. Afghanistan. <laughs> there you go, Iraq, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> all right. So now let's talk about some not so positive things that happened because we were all scared of terrorism. Patriot Act. Ah, boy, the Patriot Act. All right, so what the Patriot Act basically said is like, hey, you should have nothing to hide. We need to stop them terrorists because we can have another 9-11. All right, so the Patriot Act basically allowed the U.S. Intelligence Service to basically uh, look through your private security. And uh, let's see, check for understanding. Who's on the $100 bill? Who's on the $100 bill? Anybody? Use your voice. Use your words. I'm waiting. That was really funny, Z. Anybody with their words, because this is like, you have mics, and because it's like, I don't know, April? It's April, right? It's April. That's April. Yes, Zach, Mr. Benjamin Franklin. And he had a famous quote that says, those who sacrifice freedom in the name of security shall have neither. And uh, yeah, we sacrificed our freedoms in the name of security. Because basically everybody post 9-11, right? We're feeling united. We're scared. We're nervous. We're worried. We want to make sure that no 9-11s happen again, right? And so when the government said, hey, let us read your emails. Let us listen to your phone calls, right? And then, you know, no 9-11s will happen. And they were able to pass the Patriot Acts in 2001 and 2003. And that's basically what they did. So if you all have ever seen the memes of like, oh man, my FBI agent's not gonna like when I say that on the phone or like whatever it is, like that's where this comes from. It comes from this guy's. It comes from the Patriot Act. That's not just like a regular, like no one came up with that joke out of the blue. Um, for a while and probably even now, the government still can listen to people's conversations 
and read their emails and see what people are saying. So when you guys are in party chats talking nonsense about how you're going to overthrow the government, they know about it. Unless you use a VPN. This, this brings it up for today's sponsor, NordVPN. Use promo code Mr. Cavazos to get 10% off your uh, new VPN uh, Gotta service. Get VPN now. <laughs> <laughs> because you, it all is. Yeah. Remember, we used to be sponsored by Audible on here, and I just kept saying it for a week, and then it never happened, and I gave up. Yeah. That's kind of the same thing. They must not know my plans. No, they, they can't. Not. They can't. Weird. But yeah, so those are the Patriot Acts. Um, let's move on. And again, I'll post these in a bit. I was in a meeting. Department of Homeland Security was also created. This is the largest government reorganization since World War II. Basically, a bunch of other groups like what, like Border Patrol, FBI. FBI, like a lot of federal agencies are all ATF. melded together. ATF is in there. Um, ICE. ICE, Customs and Border Protection is in there as well. CBP, all of these different groups that they've been around, but they were separate. Now they're one entity and that's the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, that is the other major shift and change. Now, questions on that? By the way, this is what you're missing out. If you're in person, you get this almost every day. Every day. It's fun times. Per day. This is our last key point here. So conflicts in the Middle East and concerns about climate change led to debates in the US over dependence on fossil fuels and the impact of the economic consumption of the environment. We're going to go back to the 1990s for just one second. And we're going to talk about Kuwait. So um, remember in the 70s, what happened in the United States uh, economically when we talk about, you know, resources? What did the United States have in resources in the Come 70s? on, Max. What happened? Come on, Max. You know this, Max. What happened Max, you know this. Take you a know guess. This. What happened? Somebody knows this. 70s, resources, struggles. What happened? Man, are they even like, hey, hey, what happened in the 70s, guys? What happened when we're talking about, like, you know, the. Type it or say it. Type it or say it. Type it or say it. I'm going to pull teeth. I'm going to do a home visit right quick. No more muscle cars. Why? Why, what Zach? Muscle cars? Why? Why? Because they have what kind of engines, Zach? What kind of engines do they have? Why the muscle cars go away? What wasn't there enough of anymore? This is so, so slow for them to respond. It's torture for me. <laughs> It's like, why are you guys bringing this pain in my life? Like, you know, the, the Zach, why? What do they have? Big yes. <laughs> so, so Zach, because of them big boy V8s, V12s, therefore what? What what was going on in the Middle East? What didn't we have enough? We of? didn't have enough of what? Uh, oil. Thank you. Thank you. So there's an oil shortage, right? So we've been dealing with that oil shortage. We had adjusted. But then it's the 1990s and that guy, Saddam Hussein, not enough. <laughs> that guy, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, that was funny. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's bring it back. That guy, Saddam Hussein, that we talk about, kind of bad guy, right? He invaded Kuwait. Now, all you got to know about Kuwait is they were giving us in the 90s most of our oil. They were the only Middle Eastern country that still talked to us. And so the United States basically is like, oh, we need that oil and we intervened. And that was Operation Desert Storm. Have you ever heard of that? That's what it is. It lasts only a couple of days because literally Iraq is like, we have tanks. And America's like, we got jets and we blew them all up. And they were like, okay, we're done. Yeah. And there was a ceasefire. And you also have to know that Kuwait, the Kuwaitis, the real thing that got uh, the Americans riled up is because they used a weapon of mass destruction, a biochemical weapon. Mm -hmm. They gassed them. Uh, they gassed them. Like, you know, who did that? Uh, Hitler Correct. did that. Oh, but like, yeah, that. like, so they were like, we can't have this uh, despot over here in Iraq gassing the Kuwaitis who are their neighbors. And mm -hmm. that's going to mess with our oil supply. And yeah. we don't want another 1978 oil crisis. Positive. So like we got to secure them oil so not only did they take the oil not only did they threaten american oil right but then they gave america a really good and justified reason for stopping this right and even the un was like yeah chemical weapon not a good idea breaking the rules let's not do that and so that's a desert storm right this is getting iraq out of kuwait but then it stopped and then iraq was like we back off we're sorry we're not going to do it again please america don't burn everything down and hence you know a few years later like in the movie Jarhead. Jarheads? Yeah. Isn't that, yeah, is that a, Desert I think, Storm? I think so. Or it might be one of the... the I thought it was the, Iraq. It might be Iraq, but it was one of those troop, uh, troop I know it's... I know, yeah. You know, if I see a little buddy and be like, hey, what kind of gas do they use in Kuwait? Oh, he probably know. I'll be like, 
not you, but what, <laughs> <laughs> what did you use? Yeah, um, but no, so yeah, that's that's what happened. Yeah, man, that's the uh, that's what essentially goes down in Desert Storm, right? So that's in the 90s. Um, overwhelming American firepower kind of makes Iraq stop in their place. Hence the issues when we get to nowadays, right? Where there's still Iraq still there, dictator still there, bad stuff. And that's again out of the dependence on oil, but don't forget Iraq used um, chemical weapons. And I'll put that in the slide because it's not in the slide. I left it out. And I'm not sure why I left it out now that I think about it. So I will put that in there. Um, the us about climate change. This is about it. We're almost done. I know the movie's uh, time's about up the movie. Um, Climate change was brought up by Al Gore. He uh, had this film, these series of lectures called An Inconvenient Truth, where he talked to people about fossil fuels and burning them was heating the planet and that it could lead to disaster in the future. Um, the thing with climate change is it's a debated topic, right? Even nowadays, people will debate whether or not it is real. It is. <laughs> um, people that say it's not real are, you know, ignoring facts, and I don't like to ignore facts. So I'll tell you right now, climate change is real. And people will still debate over how to handle it and what ways to go about it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but it's an, it's an important topic. And it's something that, honestly, guys, like my generation is not going to figure it out. It's up to y'all's too, right? You got the Musks out there trying. Um, we'll see how it goes, right? You got Nunez's Tesla truck. He's not here anymore, but that's what he wants. Um, and we'll just have to keep going from there and see how it goes. There's only a couple more minutes left, so I need to make sure these slides are updated. There's one last thing to talk about, and this is like the closing statement of a push. Uh, we're, contract, we're contractually obligated to say this. Despite economic and foreign policy challenges, the United States continues to be the world's leading superpower in the 21st century, because that's where we stand. Right now, we are the undisputed champion of the world, because the last time all the world powers fought, we won. There hasn't been a time since then. Um, so it's just something to point out, and that's just the way it is, right? Um, if you're winning the last time, then you are the winner, right? The, at least we struggle. We are. We are struggling. It's not perfect. America is not perfect, and do not ever make the mistake of thinking it is. But at the same time, do not ever make the equally bad mistake of thinking you live in a place that sucks, right? America lets you say this place sucks. America has its bad it has its good, right? The ingredients, the concepts are really good. The ideas that make up America, America, good ideas. Do we always follow them? Maybe not. Should we always follow them? Yes, and should always strive for them, right? Um, that being said, there is no more new content. We are going to be getting into review. So at least, we're <laughs> well, that's gonna end soon, but you know, it happens. Um, yeah, well, Biden wants to pull all the troops out of Afghanistan. Um, hopefully. We'll see. We'll see if he does it. Um, that being said, where are we at? Okay, so a couple of things. Oh, somebody's already on there. Well, is it? <laughs> well we're not done, guys, right? So a couple of things before we finish here. Um, for your exit ticket, all I want you to do, and I'll, I'll – tag you guys in it in a second is if you go to the quick rights on teams, I want you to respond with the date that the AP exam is and one topic that you're confident in. Like one topic that you don't need review. I know it. I'm good. I'm solid. Don't even worry about it. Glasses don't even mention it. I got this. I know it. So do that. Um, and be honest with yourself and with, you know, me, because it'll help me narrow my review. Again, tomorrow and Friday, I will not be live because I will have a training. So what I'm going to do and upload the video with the instructions for Thursday, and then I'll upload it with the instructions for Friday. And the assignment will be in Google Classroom if you are virtual. If you're in person, uh, Nunez is going to teach you guys. If there are no questions for me, you guys are good to um, head off this call. But again, I'm going to tag y'all real quick. And I see Jay's already in there, and he's got his tag. Um, the date of your exam and one topic you're confident in. See you, Desiree, have a good one.
I forgot to hit stop recording. All right, guys.